excited about Rap Coster. I really love his game design book. <laughs> and I'd like to introduce Chris Wing, who's part of the uh, committee, to uh, actually introduce uh, Rap Coster. So thanks, everybody, and I'll be seeing you throughout the whole conference. designer that doesn't need an introduction. He didn't agree, so I'm going to give him an introduction here. Um, so Raf is a professional game designer and frequent writer on issues of virtual world design. He was a lead designer on the seminal online world Ultima Online, which first brought online worlds to the mass market. Until 2006, he was the chief creative officer for Sony Online Entertainment, makers of EverQuest, where he was the lead designer on Star Wars Galaxies. His essays and writings on, on online world design include widely reprinted and influential pieces such as Declaring the Rights of Players, The Laws of Online World Design, and A Story About a Tree. He's in demand as a speaker and lecturer on issues of online world design, particularly in the area of community building. He's a regular at the Developers Conference and is the maintainer of the canonical history of virtual world at his website, raffpaster.com. His book, A Theory of Fun for Game Design, was published in 2004 and is used widely are used in several university courses as study material. Everyone, please welcome Raph Koster. Ah, yeah, those intros are so formal. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how many of you are Web3D people? And how many of you are like sandbox game people? Yeah, so when I realized that I had to give one talk that somehow was interesting to both of you, I panicked. Um, I was talking about it with my co-founder at, at my company, Metaplace, and uh, he said, all your best talks are when you tell a story. So tell a story. So I decided that I would tell a story. I, I, I'm going to tell you seven stories, actually. And um, I think I'm going to ask you to bear with me. A little bit, because some of these stories may not seem particularly relevant to you. And maybe, for all I know, none of them feel particularly relevant. But if that's the case, then at the end of it, we can all go have drinks over at the Fig, and it won't matter. <laughs> right? Hopefully, you'll have been somewhat entertained for an hour or so. Uh, but maybe, maybe they will be relevant. I don't know. Um, it's stunt speaking. You get to put it back together in your head after I say it. See if it still makes sense. Um, in that spirit, I want to start once upon a time with the story of music. Now, you're all either Web 3D or game people. Any of you actually from the music part of games? <laughs> One. Stand proud. <laughs> you're always at the bottom of the totem pole for resources, aren't you? Yeah. So here's what I want you to do, and bear with me. Close your eyes for a minute, which I realize at a graphics conference is very hard to do. <laughs> but do it, do it for me anyhow. Do we have audio back there?
like that. Yes, well, you can open it up. Music's kind of amazing, right? I mean, did you see any pictures? Anybody? I saw a meadow. You saw a meadow? Kind of like uh, someone walking through it, maybe something happened before the, when the music changed, some kind of a problem or something like that. Yes, so a meadow. Anybody else? Light playing through trees. Light playing through trees. We're all very new age here. <laughs> it's a road song, it's a traveling song. It's a traveling song. Perhaps that's if the name of that song is Longitude, as it happens. Uh, it's a good call. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that you know, that's a solo guitar piece. I actually thought about bringing my guitar and starting by playing that. And then I decided I wasn't schlepping it all the way up here and then not having anywhere to put it. And then when we went for drinks at, drinks at the Fig, what would I do with it then? And I decided not to. I figured I'd settle for a recording. So the thing about that is how much it can tell a story, right? And how much people can see pictures without seeing anything at all. And I'm going to ask you, just for a minute, as, as you might have noticed, I'm very interactive when these talks here. So... Other than the piece of music that you just heard, what was the last music, what was the last time you heard music? This morning? I, I, probably because you've been trapped here all day. Um, but you, you all have heard music in the last 24 hours, yes? When was the last time you listened to music? <laughs> <laughs> Other than, it isn't something we do very much anymore, is it, right? Listening, active listening, going out, you know, once upon a time, people would have played that guitar in your living room. The guitar was a parlor instrument, that's what that means. So was the banjo, believe it or not. Um, and uh, once upon a time, we had a very different kind of intimate relationship with it. And today... Music is no longer a medium. It's a utility like tap water. It's disposable in a way beyond disposable. We use it as wallpaper, right? And if you think about it, that's a little bit sad. The end of the first story. I'm a science fiction fan. Any of you science fiction fans? This movie sucked, didn't it? <laughs> it was really, really, really bad. This is the movie, of course, Michael Crichton regularly creates science fiction that sucks, but um, I'll, I'll try not to be too snobbish about it. This is the movie that gave us the quintessentially web 3D-ish moment of him rifling through a virtual filing cabinet at the end of a virtual hallway in order to find an incriminating virtual piece of paper. How uh, Well, there was some kind of, like, he had to hack it in another five minutes or something. I don't know. It's up. I don't remember it very well. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh my god, has science fiction gotten this wrong? <laughs> right? I mean, oh, I didn't even see this one. I mean, the first one... Uh, uh, actually, it isn't just movies that have gotten it wrong. Books have too. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but when I go to Google, I don't get any swords made out of glowing code. And I can't chop a hole in the floor to escape. Sometimes I want to, but I can't. It's funny because... A lot of what we do, and here I'm talking to both of you groups in here, a lot of what we do is driven by these people, right? Um, that's not always a bad thing, honestly. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a better thing if you're reading right now, anyway, Werner Vinge and Charlie Strauss, then you're heading in the right direction. Whereas if you're reading this still, 
because it's no longer 1992, <laughs> it means you're heading in the wrong direction. Right? Science fiction has shaped quite a lot of our dreams about what the internet is, about what 3D web means, about metaverse, cyberspace, blah, 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 all of that stuff. And it has also shaped, for better or for worse, worse, what our notion of virtual environments and games and all of that should be, and could be, and can do. Right? And they look kind of like this. Hey. Yeah, which, it's funny, flying cars, because, you know, this is, this is the school of art termed retrofuturism, um, which is, in short, the school of art about how wrong we got it. Um, <laughs> The thing about retrofuturism and science fiction and the ways in which they've made us think about the future is that they've kind of permanently infected our brains, right? We can't let go of some of these old dreams. There's a guy commercializing a flying car right now. It actually works. Personal jetpack, too. One took off in a test flight just like a week ago. I read it on Boing Boing. <laughs> and it's funny because it has circumscribed our dreams in an interesting way. Which is a strange thing to go accusing science fiction writers of. Because after all, they got us to the moon, right? No Robert Heinlein juvie novels would have meant no people walking on the moon. Not that we've gone back. But, you know, they opened up a lot of dreams. But at the same time, you know, they've kind of closed them back down again. <laughs> this is a scene from Ratchet and Clank on the PS3. It looks awfully retro-futuristic to me. So, there's something going on that I want to talk about here. Um, about the ways in which we've looked at our past, and we've decided to build our foundations on older ideas rather than new ideas. If you go back and you look at the earliest thoughts about what, what would eventually get called the internet, once the technology actually existed, you'd find it was mostly about library science. You'd find it was about the memics. You'd find it was Vannevar Bush in 1945 saying, I'll use some gestural stuff on my touch screen, and then it will give me the printout of the document that I wanted that it retrieved via pneumatic tube. Right? I mean, it was like so close and yet so far. Um, and we right now, especially right now, are caught looking at a world that isn't actually there. When we go to develop what we develop, when we make our plans for graphic engines and virtual worlds and new forms of social media, we're not doing it by looking at what the world is actually like. We're doing it by reference to this an awful lot of the time. And it's interesting because I think the kind of people that we are in this room are close to the only people on the planet who do that. Because, of course, we're the ones who get the jokes about Lawnmower Man 2, a movie nobody but us saw. <laughs> right? We, in many ways, are very insular and self-referential. And that's a good thing, because, frankly, in many ways, we're all social outcasts, and we need each other very badly. Um, <laughs> but in other ways, it can be a little dangerous if we can't stay in touch with kind of the way ordinary people live. And it makes them look at us funny sometimes. And it makes them look funny at what we make. And those of us here in this room are in the business of making things for people. So, there's a moral on that one. But, I'll come back to it. Once upon a time, there was a TV commercial. It came on as I was watching, quite against my will, a show on Cartoon Network. And it showed this little dude sliding across the face of a guy with a big nose, sailing past the Dasani water bottle, past some french fries, and landing on top of a McDonald's logo, all to the tune of some cool music. And I sat up absolutely straight and said, Oh my god, that's Line Rider. How many of you have played Line Rider? How many of you haven't played Line Rider? <laughs> <laughs> Line 
Rider is a simple little flash game where you draw lines on the screen, and at the top of wherever you first start, there's a little dude on a sled. And he slides on your lines. And I strongly encourage you to just go to YouTube to see the freaking giant palaces of Xanadu. People have created for this guy to slide around on for like 10, 15 minutes worth of unbelievable animation. Line Rider at this point has touched like 16 million people. An enviable figure. And when I mentioned the Line Rider commercial to the guys at work, they said, that's funny. Why did they pick Line Rider? I mean, it's McDonald's, for God's sake. You'd think they could pick something popular like Halo. <laughs> So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that question because um, I actually sat down and did some back-of-the-envelope math calculations, and I realized that it was quite likely that Line Rider had greater market penetration and mind share than the Cartoon Network show the commercial was on. <laughs> Strongly encourage you, you know, it has more penetration than Gossip Girl, which I bet we've all heard about, unless we really are that insular geek community, are we? Who hasn't heard about Gossip Girl? A couple billboards down there. We are from Europe. Uh, <laughs> Secret Diary of a Call Girl. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I, I have this great new Hollywood pitch. It's called The Secret Life Diary of American Teenage Call Girl. It can air both on Showtime and ABC Family at once. <laughs> The, the interesting thing about that line writer moment was that um, it made me realize, which I, I realize this on a weekly basis because of what I do right now, but it, I still need reminded weekly, right? Because everybody around me is trying to play the latest and greatest, you know, Bioshock or whatever. That um, the game business has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Are any of you in the? Are, are any of you game industry outsiders who do indie stuff? A couple, right? The good news is you guys are now the industry, right? And, and the game industry proper hasn't figured out that it isn't the industry anymore. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean you get any more respect. But, uh, <laughs> but it is the case. Um, if you go and you ask industry people, they will say, yeah, oh my god, PC SKUs are doing really terrible. PC gaming is dead. And then you go, Line Rider, 16 million. PC gaming, dead. Line Rider, incompatible thought. You know, but the hot platform today is the internet. <laughs> right? Not the consoles. In fact, I can now install printer drivers on my PlayStation 3. That to me means it is no longer a console, it is officially a PC. <laughs> if I have to deal with driver incompatibility, it is no longer a console. <laughs> the hot audience is no longer the gamer. The hot audience is ordinary people. That's who everybody's trying to reach. The hot feature is no longer single player, it is multiplayer. Blizzard is adding achievements to all Blizzard games. Huh. The hot technology is connectivity now. And the hottest games on the planet you can be done with in five minutes. That's creepy. I mean, it's freaky, it's disturbing, because A, I don't know how any of those games make money. Quite a lot of them don't. And that must strike a huge, enormous amounts of fear into the likes of EA who then respond by making more things like My Sims, and more things like Sims Carnival, or acquiring Sims on stage, which doesn't even resemble a game at all, but they can put Sims on it, so maybe it will sell the gamers, except it won't, because it's basically YouTube. Um, the game has changed completely. It's almost like the game industry is turning into not the game industry. While there's this segment over here that's still spending the money. I ran the numbers on that, too. Since 1982, our spending on a triple-A game has risen by a factor of 125. <laughs> yes, that's 125 times what we used to spend in 1982. Budgets 
you know, it, it, we've gotten six times better at making the content. So we have, we've gotten some efficiencies back, but not, not enough, right? So there's an interesting inflection point that's hitting because this isn't where the audience is. Instead, the audience is on these little things. You don't have to come to SIGGRAPH to learn how to make these graphics. What's more, an artist didn't make these graphics. A player did. Right? It's, it's user created. This is what a line writer level looks like. And you can see, I wrote on the side some of the characteristics that some of these games have. These new things. These, and some of them aren't new. Fantasy football hits this list. You want mass market gaming? Fantasy football is mass market gaming. Right? But this is also network bar trivia. It's lolcats. It's vampires on Facebook. That is where mass market game industry has gone while we weren't looking. We were sitting there spending piles of money. Instead, this is what people are doing in their parlors with their acoustic guitars, the way that they're actually interacting. Mm. McDonald's, of course, has caught on to this. McDonald's being somewhat better at market research than the game industry. Um, they're actually launching Happy Meal 3.0. <laughs> you can go there right now and log in. It is a virtual world. They're actually letting kids name the world. It's done entirely in Flash, and it's nothing but minigames. I predict that this will be bigger than WoW in 12 months. Anybody want to bet against me on this? They're putting the codes on every Happy Meal bag. Somehow, I don't think that the lovely X3D-based competitor is going to do as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I, I don't want to pick on these guys. Uh, they're, actually, they're doing rather interesting work, actually. Um, but I think there's a little bit of a mismatch of expectations here. Right? Does that person who is happy with this want everything that we do at SIGGRAPH? <laughs> the end of this story. I want to tell you about a toaster. When was the last time you saw a brilliant, innovative design for a toaster? Yeah, me either. Toasters are curious, right? Today, this is a new luxury. They exist in two flavors. Ones that you put toast in, in a slot. And ones that you put toast in, in an oven. That was a major innovation. It's fairly recent, actually. Um, the thing about toasters is that they're a symbol for us, right? We talk about toasters as something that's ubiquitous, trivially easy to use, something everybody has. Although, honestly, everybody owns one, and a hell of a lot of people don't actually eat toast every day. And yet, everybody persuades themselves that they, it's just part of the standard kitchen. You get three in your wedding gift pile, right? I mean, it's inevitable. Everybody has toasters. I said a long time ago, 13 years ago, I said, and I'm going to commit the PowerPoint sin of reading my own words. For, forgive me for the ancient terminology here. For mother, please read virtual world user. <laughs> no doubt the number of mothers will increase as the number of interneters does. But the big explosion will probably not happen until access can be made as simple as operating a toaster. Preferably with a graphical interface, which kind of dates this. Um, the primary mode that most virtual world users used back then, of course, was command line text. Right? Which does have its benefits. Um, here's the interesting thing. We do spend an awful lot of time making really, really pretty stuff on that graphical interface. But 30% of people on the planet access the internet only on a screen the size of a largish postage stamp. Exclusively on that screen. 30%. And rising. 33% 
use that and a PC. Which these days includes a PlayStation 3. <laughs> and there's something going on there. Which one is the toaster? <laughs> This is a recently released piggy bank. Tony makes it. When your kid deposits money, it goes into their gold coin stash, and they can use it to buy weapon upgrades. Oh. And then they can play the piggy bank oh my God. and uh, earn experience as they deposit and level up. I expect this to go massively multiplayer. And look, it has a screen the size of a postage stamp. Black and white. Looks about 32 by 32. <laughs> Is this the toaster? It's interesting, of course, because right now, the, the, you know, for however many Second Life may have gotten, Right now, the one everybody has to point to is World of Warcraft. But when you look at the number of users that World of Warcraft has in North America, um, this is Europe and North America. The North America figure is about uh, two and a half million right now. If you take the estimated active users per month, World of Warcraft comes in third on our table of most popular virtual worlds on the internet. And and we'll do a show of hands. How many of you have heard of Have a Hotel? The number one. Good. How many of you have heard of Sherwood Dungeon, the last? Yeah. <laughs> Written in Shockwave by a team of two. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Millsbury? <laughs> yeah, that would be Millsbury as in General Mills, as in this is a virtual world based on Breakfast. <laughs> now, the weird thing is that the toasters and postage stamps are getting a little better. Anybody want to guess what cutting edge renderer this is? Flash. This is. The Alternativa engine running in Flash 9. The headlights are in the rear view mirror. The postage stamps are catching up to us, to those of us in this room who are used to thinking instead about what amazing ray tracing we can do with the Laramie architecture. <laughs> right? There's something interesting about what other media have done when faced with this. And it's something that we haven't really successfully done. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you have heard of this particular IP. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody said no, so I'm going to proceed. <laughs> As you may know, this actually is a transmedia IP, to use the latest buzzword. It began originally as a novel. Uh, during a time period of history, really, when novels were a declining feature of American life and no longer had quite the kind of mass market penetration that they once had. I mean, at one point, the novel was important enough that people lined up in mobs, literal mobs, like hundreds deep on the docks to wait for the new Dickens chapters to show up. Right? So, you know, Gone with the Wind, as big as it might have been, a blockbuster, whatever. I mean, this is in the decline and fall of the novel at this point, right? Nonetheless, it was moderately popular, achieved some cultural recognition, then was transmogrified into a different IP, and became a movie, which also achieved some moderate success, which when adjusted for inflation and ticket prices, turns out to still be right near the top of the heap. The interesting thing about this is that it doesn't really matter how much we think that Clark Gable is Rhett Butler. He ain't. Right? I mean, Rhett Butler is actually still on the pages of the book, but he's here, and he's here, and he's here. This is what an IP cut free of graphics can do. Now, 
I bring this up just to, to point out, because, I mean, we are here talking about, you know, a whole week about pictures is about to happen. <laughs> um, how little pictures can matter. And hark back to that lovely guitar music you heard me play at the beginning. Because an awful lot of central things in our culture have managed to be incredibly relevant and important and get reinterpreted for new generations. This is a novel retelling the story of the missing dad, in case you ever wondered where the hell he went. Why wasn't he around while his daughter was dying of pneumonia? Yeah, you can read this book and find out. <laughs> and this has happened over and over again. I mean, Wicked, the novel becomes Wicked, the musical, now Wicked, the movie's coming. It happens in the other direction. I mean, the songs turn into the pop hits, which become the stage musical, which now become a really dreadful movie with Meryl Streep. And, you know, it happens in all kinds of directions, but it doesn't happen very, it happened very well with what we do. We're not very good at this whole transmedia, creating IP that exists in this vague, nebulous space that isn't tied to representation. If I flip back to Ratchet and Clank and take away the big ears, can you tell me what Ratchet and Clank is? You wouldn't have any problem with this, right? There's something there that it doesn't really matter what it looks like. In fact, it's so malleable and so flexible that we feel completely comfortable with people taking it and doing crazy, crazy shit with it, right? And it's perfectly fine with us because we understand that to some degree we own this idea ourselves. It has become a design that has gone beyond what its creator's intent and gone beyond the way that its creator's work with it. <laughs> there are people out there right now in other segments of the entertainment industry who do this on purpose. We're in L.A. Anybody here from Hollywood? No? They just don't want to raise their hands. You know, but when you look at the kinds of things that are happening today in Hollywood, around TV shows like Lost and Heroes, they're doing this on purpose. And Lost is no longer what ends up on the film. And yet somehow our game Somehow our, our notion of, of creativity still is bound up in this. So I'll leave that as a little moral, and maybe we'll come back to it. <coughs> Once upon a time, there was an august body of mostly white males. They were a very self-important group. They formed committees. They used a gavel. They talk amongst themselves a lot, and they posture for others and they really desperately want to, to be highly respected so that people give them money so that they can stay in their chambers and continue to pound gavels. But they're very important and vital, in fact, to the functioning of our democracy. Does anybody know who this is? If you squint, you can read it at the bottom, because this is Representative Edward Markey of the United States House of Representatives. <laughs> and this would be his second life avatar. Because you see, this year we had the notable event, and it is a major notable event, of there being a congressional hearing held on the subject of virtual worlds and virtual world law simultaneously at Congress and in Second Life. That's really cool. Of course, it also led to uh, the Washington Post commenting, in unwitting observance of April Fool's Day, because, after all, some of the people attending the hearing were large, fluffy, pink rats. <laughs> yeah, I want to hark back here to that whole retro future thing, and, and who do we talk to, and who do we interact with, and what are our references? I mean, frankly, if there were giant pink rabbits sitting in this room, I, for one, would feel no qualms whatsoever. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of used to that. <laughs> I bet a lot of you guys are, too. Is anybody here going to fess up to having something higher than a level 15 in WAP? Yeah, see? 
And does it look like the giant bull or like the nearly pornographic chick with the ears up to here? <laughs> Both, yeah. So yeah, fluffy pink rabbits, not out of the question, really. But somehow the rest of the world don't quite see it, right? <laughs> like, what the hell is this rabbit doing here when you should be worrying about the price of gas or whether or not uh, Russia is invading Georgia and all of that kind of thing, right? And yet, to us, this feels important and feels significant. Um, I think we don't always understand how little what we do can matter to the ordinary person. Um, so this guy, ironically, is a science fiction writer, just to tie it back a little bit. Robert J. Sawyer, multiple Hugo Award not, uh, winner, actually. He's won many awards for his science fiction. And yet, here's one of those guru types who set our entire path, saying virtual reality is air guitar writ large and meaningless. <laughs> now, so clearly he hasn't played rock band. <laughs> <laughs> but he has a point. He does have a point. Because there is some element of what we do that is pink bunny rabbits in Congress and isn't quite connecting, right? It takes something like a rock band, which is a completely and thoroughly non-science fictional fantasy, right? A completely mundane and ordinary fantasy for people. The fantasy I didn't get to fulfill by bringing a guitar and opening the conference. Of something we all wish, right? It's very ordinary. I mean, sure, for the guys it tends to be the strat, and for the girls it's more bouncing with the hairbrush on the bed for the mirror, but nonetheless, I mean, come on, everybody should fess up. We've all dreamt it, right? The fantasy that crossed over was not the retro future giant jetpack and flying car one, was it? It wasn't the one that we all grew up dreaming about that got us into this business. The end of that tale. So the next story. Once upon a time, there was a country of Kenya. This is my telephone. It is obsolete, and yes, it runs Windows Mobile. I'm sorry. <laughs> There are one billion people on the planet who live on less in a year than I spent on this phone. A lot of them live in Kenya, as it happens. This is a traditional Maasai warrior with a cell phone, with a screen the size of a postage stamp. I bet you could play Line Rider on that thing. The interesting thing that's going on, there's a company in Kenya called uh, Safaricom, and Vodafone now owns a chunk of them. And, um, you know, at first nobody thought that doing a cell phone company in Kenya would make any sense at all. But today, Safaricom has something like 10 million users in Kenya. <laughs> and part of the reason is because um, they, they don't charge by cell phone minutes, they, they charge by the second. I kid you not. Literally, cell phone by the second. And in fact, they've actually had a problem now because, you know, it can be kind of dangerous in Kenya sometimes. You can get robbed. It's a long way from town out to the villages. Um, a lot of people wanted to keep in touch, but they couldn't afford to call people to tell them where they were, and there were no landlines out there anyway. So um, instead, they would dial the number and hang up while it was still ringing, which clogged up the network like crazy, but at least people could keep in touch. So much so that Safaricom actually had to allow five free texts a day for everybody, because people needed it to keep in touch. And the result of this is that today, Safaricom is like all over the place. In fact, if you look worldwide at the posted stamp-sized screens, which don't display the pretty graphics, and don't display all of the wonderful pictures, and don't display the giant ratchet and clank ears, they way, way outnumber the kinds of platforms we're used to working on. Because they fill particular needs, like not getting mugged on your way home. 
In Kenya, they'll, they'll call it bob. It's the Kenyan shilling, technically. But it's like, oh, 10 bob, right? Well, it's a lot better to use your phone to text the money home than it is to use a bank account. Because in Kenya, nobody can get to the bank, but everybody can get to the local cell phone outlet. So the virtual currency in Kenya in which people put their savings is M-Pesa, and it is run by Safaricom, the partially owned subsidiary of Vodafone. This isn't unique to Kenya either. I mean, it's spreading out. China has the QQ coin, which has actually occasioned Chinese legislation because China started to get a little bit worried that people were literally keeping their entire life savings in QQ coins. QQ coins are used in order to play the jewel. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting to see the ways in which what we do has touched people in ways we really, really, really didn't think about. I don't think that the guys who made the jewel that popped out ever thought that a pirated Korean version would become the backbone of the rural Chinese economy. <laughs> and yet it did. And I guess part of the moral of this particular piece of the story would be, why didn't we think of that? What is it about our frame of reference that keeps us from realizing that something like playing a stupid toy plastic guitar isn't a niche product that will never sell, as was said at great length before Guitar Hero came out. And why is it we don't realize that the ability to acquire virtual coins and currency is going to literally become a $1.2 billion industry around the Pacific Rim? And why is it we don't understand that, yes, scribbling lines in black and white is going to be a more resonant experience with today's youth than Halo 3? What is it about the blinders we as an industry have when we don't understand how people use our stuff? Because this matters a lot. This is the real power of what we do. Not running around in rocket-shaped monorail buildings in some virtual island fantasy. How many of this year's SIGGRAPH demos will run on this machine? <laughs> Which, if it succeeds, will become probably the single most important computing platform in a continent. Why isn't the industry making these games? Why is it that instead it has to be a bunch of crazy guys at various universities? I mean, granted, it's always been crazy guys at various universities who have accomplished great things. Um, many of you are in the room. I <laughs> say that. <laughs> but we're the ones who know how to do this, right? That's what we tell ourselves. Where's the money? Well, 10 million subscribers in Kenya ain't chump change. And QQ coins make a lot of money. Um, more money than I care to think about. It's an interesting question. One of the things that's happening, like the piece of music I played for you, which is not registered with ASCAP, um, is that a lot of this trend is for creative content to be donations to society. The entire music industry is currently a donation to society. <laughs> so I think the question for us is how long until everything on the postage stamp screens, because actually pretty much all Flash games are line writers a donation to society. Uh, the line writer guys have, have clearly been, McDonald's paid them, so clearly they're making some money. Yeah. I think it's an excellent question. I'll tell you bluntly, I don't know where the money is. I think one of the things that's starting to happen is that content's value on the open market is approaching zero. That 
doesn't mean people won't make money. Do you know what this is? Do any of you shop at Target? Nobody fesses up to shopping at Target. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with shopping at Target. This is a rack that lives next to the extraordinarily large PC games aisle at Target. Which, by the way, is extraordinarily large. It does, in fact, dwarf the PlayStation 3 aisle at Target. It is full of, those of you in the game industry will know how shocking this is, adventure games. <laughs> really? Like, up to episode 12 of the Nancy Drew series, I kid you not. Right? Nothing but adventure games, as far as the eye can see. One aisle over, right next to the top-selling pop albums, is this rack. This rack is the United States equivalent of QQ coins. This rack is prepaid virtual currency cards for all of the games that you guys aren't playing <laughs> that were on that graph. It's funny because, um, wow, it's not on this rack. <laughs> this is where the kids are. They work just like phone cards. Prepaid minutes. Prepaid currency, you spend them. In fact, they worked a lot like the M-Pesa stuff that people in Kenya use to send home their savings. I don't think we thought when we were going, oh yes, Web 3D, that one of the core business skills we would need to have for Web 3D was to be fiduciary institutions. But I'm here to tell you today that that is a more central core competency to Web 3D and the metaverse than rendering is. Weird. <laughs> so I really didn't go into this business thinking that would be the case. You might mention, notice I haven't really mentioned consoles very much in this whole thing. Um, that's because they are this. <laughs> Once upon a time in Australia, if you bought a radio, you had to pick and choose. Are you going to buy the radio for station A, or the radio for station B? <laughs> this lasted until the 1920s when somebody hacked a radio. Yeah. I leave you to draw your own conclusions on that one. The reason why this can be a joint keynote is because there is no difference anymore between the games guys and the Web3 guys. You are actually working in exactly the same industry, even if you don't know it. The danger, of course, is that both of you be working in this industry without realizing you're also working in the same industry as Safaricom in Kenya. Because you are. That is the name of the game now. We're not going to get to split up this pie in these tiny little pieces anymore. And smart people have figured this out, by the way. I don't know how many of you are currently working on really cool ATI or NVIDIA hardware, but if you want to know what my current best bet for the console of the future is, it's Flash. Because they just signed a deal to make it an open standard put on all of these televisions and phones. And look at the list of partners they have. <laughs> oh my god. That's kind of scary, actually, because if Flash wins, then we still have one Viewmaster to write for. And we don't want to have just one. We want to have many. But, you know, what we're seeing here is a convergence towards a very different kind of world. This is a world where the average screen resolution on PCs has dropped in the last two years, not risen. And the reason is because people want smaller laptops. This laptop here has a very nice screen. It's a tablet PC, and I can draw on it 1400 by 1050. I can't upgrade because the factory making that size screen has been closed permanently because the average size for a laptop screen has shrunk. We're heading for the postage stamp land. 
Web3D is a bad name. Sorry, you conference organizers. Because <laughs> the web in 3D probably won't be in 3. And it isn't going to be about visuals. If we really want to be having an academic conference forecasting the future of the inter-network, metaverse, ultra-connected reality, we need to be asking what is the client that runs on that toaster? The literal toaster, the one that makes bread. Because, honestly, I am going to see that toaster networked to my refrigerator before my kids go to their prom. That is Web 3D. Sandbox, sorry, organizer, is a really bad name. Because it says, look, here's a game we made. You can come past the wooden plank into the sand and play with the toys in there. Please don't get any sand out of the box. The toys, you can do everything you want in there, but the sand stays in the box. That is already not our world. And any of you who have a customized Yahoo page, no, it is not our world. Any of you who use Facebook and have plugged in applications that are literally querying 50 websites just to pull up your picture of your puppy, no, that is not the real world today. The sandbox has exploded. It is everywhere. Every single one of the technologies on here. Augmented reality. Lenses that let you see holographic stuff floating in front of your eyes. Foldable screens that you could wear on your t-shirt is currently on the path to commercialization and adoption right here. Now. Just like the flying car. We're not in science fiction land anymore. And Snow Crash had it really wrong. Really, really wrong. When we come to a conference about the future of game design, when we come to discuss the future of graphics, it isn't about pixel fill rate. Right? It's about what can people do with the pixels they got. All technology exists to serve people. It isn't about polygons. It's about personalities. It's about meeting needs. And we have to broaden our notion of needs out of getting to the boss at the last end of the level and back onto the things that are actually breaking ground, like we fit. <laughs> Why did none of us think of we fit? Why does it take that Japanese genius to kick us in the ass over and over again? <laughs> What's going on there? Why is it we still dream of that crazy Jetsons world? Because that isn't where we're going. It isn't where we are now. So I've told you seven stories. They're all the same story. Someday, we're going to walk over to Starbucks. We're going to sit down. There's going to be musical wallpaper, for sure. But you know what? Starbucks is a music label now. One of the Beatles works for Starbucks. And we're going to sit down there, and when we sit down, blink our eyes, our contact lens will pop up, the Starbucks virtual world, right there. But it's going to be rendered in such a way that we can reach right through it so we can get our triple half-calf decaf, triple whatever latte, right? And it's going to know to transparently log you into the appropriate virtual world for wherever you're standing. It's going to annotate the caloric intake of your latte. It's going to tell you that your friend is actually still back at the office and he's got an order for this. Because, you know what, Web3D is going to be about staying in touch and delivering coffee back to your buddy back at work. And it might even look like a game. You might have to jump over some logs and fireballs to get it back there. Because by doing so, you might earn some more cash for your Starbucks card. Which is accepted when you make your mortgage payment. <laughs> that is Web 3D. That is the sandbox. That's what's almost here now. 
Because the nasty secret is, you can almost build that right now with off-the-shelf open source tech. Right now. So, given that, let's listen to Squawk. Stanford recently, the uh, Metaverse Roadmapping Project happened under the auspices of um, uh, the Acceleration Studies Foundation. And uh, it actually breaks into four parts. Virtual Worlds is going to continue to be a significant part of it, but uh, one thing I didn't show you is actually a video survey that's it's floating around right now. I've got a lot of blogosphere attention. Um, fully half of the major virtual worlds in development right now actually run in Flash and 2D and embedded in the browser. Um, I think we're within a year or two of seeing virtual worlds use a standard ad banner technology, rather than thinking in terms of the immersive space. Um, the other areas that we really need to be looking at in terms of what Web3D is going to become, AR is a big part of it, particularly uh, geotagging, geolocation, geoannotation, that kind of thing. Mirror worlding is also going to be a significant part of what goes on. Um, this is, that's replicating real world environments into virtual environments in order to do takeoffs, further exploration, virtual tourism, that sort of thing. Um, and the third big part is life logging, which I really barely touched on. Um, and that's essentially recording absolutely everything you do. Um, Web3D is really going to exist at the intersection of those four things. Um, virtual worlds, mirror worlds, uh, uh, AR, and life logging. And uh, that isn't really a space that is, it's, it's a space that is representation agnostic is the key message, I guess. If, if anything, that's the underlying moral to all seven stories, is representation agnosticism. The value behind things like transmedia IPs, behind things like the virtual currency on the phone, the value to all of those things is, in fact, that they are independent of display. And Web3D 
as it takes root, and we already see it taking root, is actually, you know, it's going to lose the 3D part. It's just going to be wet. And we need to start thinking in terms of how our technologies adapt to that. Because um, that kind of representation agnostic, device independent, display independent existence is really what's going to be at the heart of the metaverse, to go back to Neil Stevenson's term. So, aspects of AR. But, I mean, we shouldn't forget, I mean, how many of you are walking around with a phone right now and have ever used it for asking for directions? Checking a 